Hi, John McGrady here again with the interview with the Famous Statistician series. This is our seventh installment, and it's an honor and a privilege to have Dr. Scott Zeger here today. Dr. Zeger is the Vice Provost of Research for the entire Johns Hopkins University, and he's also a professor in my department, the Department of Biostatistics. And prior to serving as the Vice Provost role, he was the chair for 12 years, and I came on board under his tutelage. He's been very influential in how I think about statistics and think about teaching statistics, and he's been a supporter of science and technology education both here at the Bloomberg School and at the Homewood campus and throughout the school, and currently is involved teaching uh, the undergraduate public health majors. So Scott, I could go on and on about Scott and his great contributions to statistics and to public health, but you're probably more interested in hearing him speak, so I'll save that for the end, but I just wanted to welcome you here today, Scott. Thanks, John. Great. So uh, My mother thanks you for that. <laughs> so, um, well, I, I'm thrilled to do it. So, um, uh, you've been very active in the field over, you know, the past 30 years. You did your graduate work at Princeton under the tutelage of John Tukey and Peter Bloomfield, and then came to Hopkins uh, and, and made some huge contributions to uh, public health, including the uh, famous and very often cited generalized estimating equations approach which we'll talk about a little bit as an extension of the regression methods we do in this class. So you've been up on the trends in statistics and public health for many years. So I wonder if you could comment briefly on one or two you know, major contributions to public health made in conjunction with statistics in say the past decade or so? Past decade? Yeah, so, so. Um, I think statistics has uh, been very influential in, in, in how we formulate public health problems and I would say that uh, public health has moved uh, quite dramatically into uh, embracing the more complicated data that's being measured now. Uh, typically, you know, early in days we would do a, a randomized trial and it would be a single outcome like whether there was a survival or not. Now we follow people, we measure them repeatedly over time, or we do interventions in communities and we're interested in the effects uh, on the individual but also on the family and on the community and so we we look at many levels of intervention and uh, Statistics has moved so that we could represent these multiple levels and these repeated measurements over time and other kinds of more complex data. And of course, the most complex data recently over the last 10 years has been the genomic information which is now available to us, which helps us to or, uh, detect disease early or, or have new ways of measuring health uh, through genetic and epigenetic measurements. And there's very exciting problems now in that area. So in general, I would say it's it's been embracing the new ways of measuring health and in the new kinds of interventions we do and, and capturing the complexities of those interventions and of those measurements. Excellent, yeah. And so where do you see this going in the future as data gets bigger and bigger and the levels and such? Uh, you know, what are the sort of uh, both computational and statistical opportunities, you know, that, that are facing our profession? Right. So. Um, one thing is that um, the kind of people who work in biostatistics departments, uh, those that they will be diversifying. Traditionally, you came from a straight statistics or biostatistics training, but these days, a lot of the problems require more substantive knowledge, for example, more knowledge in genomics or possibly more computational skill than we typically are trained in statistics. And so computer scientists now play a role in, in the kinds of problems we do. Also, it, what's true is that um, Many computational, computationally oriented fields or statistically oriented fields like computer science or like economics, in particular econometrics or sociology or even political science, a lot of areas where um, a lot of fields that traditionally hadn't been very quantitative are becoming highly quantitative. Mm -hmm. And people coming out of those sorts of programs, you know, play a role in quantitation in public health. So you're seeing a, I think, a diversification of uh, quantification. Quanti quantitative experts in, in public health. In terms of the issue of where, um, where will we be going, uh, I, I do think you're going to see more complexity, but I, I don't believe, as some do, uh, that where we have bigger data sets and greater complexity, that somehow we can uh, you know, find truth amidst all of these large data sets without strong prior hypotheses and strong substantive knowledge about what are the right questions and what, where are the right places to look within the data. So even, even though the data sets are getting bigger, and some people think, in particular people who tend to come out of computer science backgrounds, think that there's an artificial intelligence that will help us find truth amidst all that complex data, the so-called data mining. Data mining, right, uh, that, yeah. That somehow that's, that's separated from 
prior expert judgment or expert knowledge in the field. I, I totally reject that notion. And I think the more you know about the mechanisms underlying the complex data, the more chance there is to discover something useful in there. So that makes perfect sense. So it's being grounded in the science of the idea first I, and I, foremost. I, I totally agree, John. And in fact, if you know, graduate students these days really have to train themselves both in quantitative methods, but also in the substantive methods of, of a particular specialty. So we're actually talking at the university level about a new kind of PhD program, which is represented by the Greek letter pi, mm -hmm. with two legs, one in a substantive area and one in a quantitative area, and then a curly brace that goes across the top of the two legs, which the represents divide, yeah. the general knowledge that bridges the, the, the two specialties. And I think that really is the future of PhD training in biostatistics and in other quantitative fields. So what would you call that sort of field, like quantitative? Uh, quantitative public, public health, health or, quantitative yeah. biology. You know. So you sort of quantitative plus some other modifier. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. great. That's, yeah. a, that's a really neat idea. So let me, uh, speaking of sort of big data sets and prior hypotheses and, you know, the richness of the data. I mean, one of the opportunities, it seems to me, that you've spent a lot of time thinking about with the large data sets we were able to collect, not just at a population level, but the richness of what we collect on, for individuals within that data set has led to opportunities for better customizing the results from population-based studies to actual ma making individual decisions. And so you were sort of spearheading a working group and a, on, on that idea of personalized medicine. And could you just talk a little bit about that idea? Yeah, so uh, thanks. About uh, two and a half years ago, a group of us from across the university and also the health system and the applied physics laboratory uh, started thinking about how we would use genomic data and epigenetic data in the treatment of patients, or, or not just the treatment of patients, but in detecting disease early in healthy populations and then, and then intervening early. And um, as we began to look at this new complex information that would be coming available, would be becoming available, we started realizing that if you look at most uh, public health programs uh, for prevention, or most um, screening programs for disease, or most treatment programs, we don't use the current information we have, like age and prior health experience and family history and other sorts of variables. We don't use that data very well right now. And so how, what are we going to do with trillions of right. new pieces of information? And this idea that somehow we'll turn on fast computers and the computers will figure out what to do, that's just, that's just a pipe dream. So right, it goes back to that mining versus... Exactly, right. exactly. When you mine, you mine for fool's gold. <laughs> right. So, so um, we started talking about how to use information more wisely in public health and, and in, 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 in medicine. And I've actually um, come to understand really what is what people call the, the Bayesian perspective on, on uh, decision making, namely that, that you have to have better knowledge about, about, about populations of people and understand what works and what doesn't work in a population. And then as a new person arises and you're trying to screen them or you're trying to decide, make a treatment decision for them, you need to reference this person against the population and you need to take the measurements on this person which are usually made with considerable error. We don't, mm -hmm. we don't make perfect measurements in either public health or medicine. So you have to sort of temper the, measure, the, the measurements for that person against what we know for the population. And this is a methodology called Bayes estimation. Mm -hmm. And we, we're trying to build some of these ideas and, uh, and make them the current practice in areas of uh, Johns Hopkins medicine. So one example is we're working closely with colleagues in epidemiology, Elizabeth uh, Platts and our, our colleagues in medicine, uh, Bal Carter, and Craig Pollock, and others, and we're actually trying to individualize how we screen for cancer. So when you come into Hopkins right now, you'd, you'd be screened based upon whatever our doctors learned back in medical school and what they've read in the recent uh, guidelines. But what we'd like to do is actually take our best scientists and put algorithms in place that take advantage of what we know about you, about your family history, about your age, about your life expectancy, about the previous screening um, measurements that have been made, and then we want to have a screening algorithm for you, a protocol in hmm. the future that's tailored to what your needs are, so that we stop wasting um, effort on screening that doesn't really teach us very much useful. And we don't then uh, expose you to potentially risky screens themselves, or, right. or then sequelae if you happen to have a false positive screen, you, you tend to then get interventions which aren't good for your health. We want to improve all of that, and then we want to make it more systematic across all the many places where Johns Hopkins doctors 
practice medicine. So in our capitated care systems, the primary care systems in our hospitals and other places. And so we're working on how to, how to do this now. And we have five or six examples. Cancer screening is one of them. You know, trying to do di diagnosis from um, radiologic evaluations, looking at autoimmune disease and some others, hmm. where we're trying to use modern information methods to improve the practice of medicine. And then the idea would be to sort of translate that to other populations and hopefully improve the, uh, the American health system. I see. So in other words, using the current study to for each individual to use their prior information to better update their path going forward. So that's sort of the Bayesian framework there, yeah. right? And then combining this information to sort of find form a baseline prior about other populations from which to draw upon. Yeah, and, we, and we're going to be capturing all of the experience that yeah. we had in research at Johns Hopkins, but also in patient care at Johns yeah. Hopkins, so that when a decision needs to be made for a new patient, we have the experience of all the patients and research subjects who've come before, and we can then bring that information to bear and make a better decision. That's fantastic. So, uh, so this uh, introduces some other interesting issues to consider, and certainly we don't talk enough about this in the class, and maybe not in statistics in general, but you're a good person to ask, sort of, when you're collecting this much data at the individual level, you know, and, and using it uh, as per the patient's request, per se, what are the ethical issues to keeping this data confidential, and et cetera, et cetera, so. That's a great question, and, and uh, we're actually talking, uh, and in fact, the Berman Institute at Johns Hopkins yeah. has already been uh, leading conversations and writing papers for three or four year, years now about a new way to view um, sort of bioethics as it pertains to using information about subject, research subjects and patients. Um, without changing any of the basic bioethical principles, the question is why isn't it possible for us in the practice of medicine at Johns Hopkins to learn from our experiences from previous patients so that the next patient is treated optimally. And in fact, you could argue that it's not ethical to have had all of this experience on prior patients and not and use not that use information it. Yeah, that's a good point. to bring it to bear on a new patient. So we need, in order to, to have a system where each patient contributes to those who come after and each patient is contributed to by all those who came before, we need new bioethical procedures. So we need new consent forms for patients. We need to change what it means to be a patient a little bit so that you, you come at, to Johns Hopkins and we, we would like you to become part of a to consent to become part of a learning community where we use your data for, future, for, for the patients that follow you, but also we treat you as best as possible in light of all the patients who came before you. And so we want to make, we really want to merge uh, to, to the extent possible clinical research and clinical care so that all of that information is used to improve everybody's health. Excellent, excellent. Very exciting field and I'm looking forward to it moving forward and learning more about how it works. And so finally, Scott, Scott, as I said before, has been very actively involved in sort of um, the basic biostatistical education of students at the School of Public Health. He taught here for years in one of the introductory series, and now he's doing the same thing up for the public health majors at the undergraduate campus. And Scott, you know, we're talking in the context of videos I'm making essentially for my introductory course, the Statistical Reasoning Series. And it's only a two-quarter course, you know, but it covers maybe the greatest hits, you know, the important ideas of biostatistics, or at least I'm saying they are, and I wanted to see what you thought about how, how critical and important sort of the basics are, the basics of exploratory data analysis, uh, basics of estimation and inference, and modeling are to sort of moving the field forward. Yeah, so um, I tell you, I, I think we've, we've had a sea change in statistical education, and I think now, whereas in the past we focused on the methods, you mm -hmm. know, we spent a lot of time teaching how to do the t-test and how to do it if there's equal variances, unequal variances, and doing this test and that test, and I remember we, we, we used to have lots of flow charts of if this <laughs> kind of data and if this kind of question, and then, you know, you know you've been right, there, right. right. So, been there. Um, yep. I think that stuff's less important now. I think what's really important is, is to learn how to reason critically. And really, statistics is about using evidence. Mm -hmm. And so how to understand what is the evidence, how to make pictures of the evidence, how to use the evidence to choose among competing hypotheses, and how to then communicate what you've learned from that evidence. Th those are the key ideas in statistical thinking. And I think if our students master how to think about data, how to understand about measurement error and, and sources of variation and some of the key substantive issues that pertain to quantitation of public health data, then, then um, I think we've, we've done them right. And, and I think we've always had a focus at Johns Hopkins 
at the interface of public health and statistics. And we, we don't just teach statistics, we try to s teach statistics as a set of ways of, a, a way of reasoning about public health and some tools that help us put that reasoning into practice. I think that's what we've always done. I think we'll continue to see it more that way. So those who are in introductory courses that focus on, on ideas, you're learning like the 90% of the cream, and then and then the, really there's 10% in, in the details, but if you master the ideas, the details come much more easily, and especially now with simple to use computing systems that, that actually can execute a lot of the, a lot of the right. ideas without having to know all the inner workings. Inner workings so you can focus on interpreting right. the results, exactly. Right. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you. I thank you for taking the time out. Uh, it's always great to have Scott back in the School of Public Health building. He's here twice a week, and I know I appreciate it and the students do, and uh, we'll try and have you back again soon to talk more great. about personalized medicine. Thanks, thank you, John. sir.